Arnold James, a seasoned 41-year-old angler, had become intimately familiar with the tranquil waterways of Florida over the years. Fishing was more than a hobby for him. It was a way of life, a cherished tradition passed down through generations. On this particular fateful day, Arnold had set out with his trusted fishing companion Russo Black to explore the murky marshlands of Florida. As the first rays of dawn bathed the landscape, the two friends prepared for a day of angling beneath the vast Florida sky. Each man had his vessel. They exchanged a few words, their conversation filled with the anticipation that always accompanied their fishing escapade. With a firm handshake and a nod, they parted ways temporarily, knowing they would reconvene later. Arnold maneuvered his boat to the right side of the river, a carefully chosen spot. Anchoring his boat in the chosen spot, Arnold prepared for his first cast of the day. With a practiced hand, he sent his net spiraling into the water, its mesh unfolding into the water. Time seemed to slow as he watched the water surface, each ripple holding the promise of a catch. With patience, he waited, knowing that the river had its rhythms and secrets. Finally, as the sun's rays filtered through the water, Arnold felt the first signs of life. A gentle tug on the net sent a thrill through his body. He knew that a school of fish had taken the bait beneath the surface. It was a gratifying moment that spoke to the skill and intuition that came with years of experience. Arnold didn't rush. He knew a successful catch required finesse and precision. He drew the net back toward his boat with steady hands, its contents hidden from view. When the net was finally within reach, Arnold gently emptied its contents into the boat. It was a sight to behold, a shimmering array of fish, their scales catching the sunlight in a dazzling display. Satisfied with his initial haul, Arnold knew there was more to be discovered beneath the water's surface. While Arnold had been fortunate in his spot on the right side of the river, Russo's attempts on the left side hadn't been as fruitful, so he decided to sail his boat closer to Arnold's. It was at this tranquil moment that a sudden shift occurred in the atmosphere. The water's surface seemed to ripple with tension, and Arnold's keen eyes detected a disturbance in the river's calm demeanor. He squinted toward the source of the commotion, a feeling of unease gnawing at his gut. What they saw next sent a jolt of adrenaline through their veins. Emerging from the depths was a great white shark looming ominously in the water. Turning to Russo, Arnold relayed his concerns in hushed tones. Their voices tinged with a mix of fascination and caution. The two friends deliberated the possibilities of the species, their shared knowledge and mutual respect evident in their animated discussion. As they spoke, the shark drew nearer to their boats, its curiosity piqued by the unusual presence of these human intruders in its territory. Russo, ever the adventurous spirit, couldn't help but suggest an audacious plan. He proposed they capture the great white shark, envisioning the financial rewards from such a feat. He spoke of the immense value of the creature's meat and fins in the market. Arnold, however, was a man guided by a deep respect for the natural world. He believed in leaving the river's inhabitants in their rightful place, undisturbed by human interference. During their conversation, as Arnold continued to explain his convictions to Russo, the shark seized a rare opportunity. With a swift, powerful motion, it lunged at Arnold's hand, which had been extended into the water during their discussion, and pulled him into the water. The shock of the attack coursed through Arnold's body, his initial confusion giving way to a primal instinct for survival. In a desperate bid to escape the predator's jaws, he thrashed in the water with the strength and agility of a fish evading capture. Russo, witnessing the harrowing scene unfolding before him, reacted with swift determination. He paddled his boat closer to Arnold. With all his might, he reached out to help his friend back onto the boat, their fingers grasping for purchase amid chaos. Arnold, his right hand dripping with blood, was finally pulled to safety. Russo's boat sped away from the site of the attack, leaving behind the unsettling scene that had unfolded on the water's surface. Once ashore, Arnold received immediate medical attention for his injuries. The bites, while terrifying, were not life-threatening, and he counted himself fortunate to have escaped. The swift and professional response of park rangers was crucial in the aftermath of Arnold's harrowing encounter with the shark. With precision and care, they provided immediate medical assistance to Arnold, recognizing the severity of his hand injuries. An air ambulance was called in. Arnold was airlifted to the hospital, 
where a team of skilled surgeons and medical professionals work tirelessly to treat his wounds and initiate his recovery process. Weeks turned into a challenging road to recovery, but Arnold's determination shone through. Although his hand would never regain its full range of motion and flexibility, he refused to let this setback keep him from the passion that defined his life. Arnold returned to the water, adapting to the changes his injuries had imposed on his angling technique. He learned to use his strength and resilience to compensate for losing talent, finding new ways to cast his line and reel in his catches. Rather than seeking vengeance or harboring anger, Arnold channeled his passion for fishing into a new mission, advocating for preserving rare and endangered sea animals. His unique perspective, born from the depths of his encounter with a shark, gave him a powerful voice in the conservation community. Inamoto Kubo, hailing from Japan, had called New South Wales his home for over 15 years. Like many dedicated construction workers, his life was marked by the rigors of hard labor and the dust and grime that clung to him at the end of each workday. However, Kubo found solace and rejuvenation in the pristine waters of New South Wales. The ocean offered him a sanctuary to wash away the weariness of the day, a place where he could find solace and respite from the toils of his profession. On that fateful day in May 1978, Kubo's journey led him to Bellina Beach. Having just completed a construction project, he took a short bus ride to the coastal haven. The sun hung lazily in the sky, casting its warm glow upon the glistening waves, beckoning Kubo to its embrace. Kubo ventured further into the sea, blissfully unaware of the imminent peril that lurked beneath the surface. Little did he know that fate had other plans that would thrust him into the heart of a life-or-death struggle with one of the ocean's most formidable predators. Suddenly, without warning, the serene waters transformed into a scene of terror and chaos. From the depths emerged a colossal menace, a tiger shark of monstrous proportions, measuring a chilling three meters in length. In a flash, the shark seized Kubo from beneath, its powerful jaws clamping onto his legs with a vice-like grip. This relentless predator of the deep dragged him beneath the waves. Screams and gasps erupted from the other swimmers, who had been blissfully ignorant of the imminent danger. Kubo's life hung in the balance. He groaned in so much pain and agony. The other swimmers, gripped by fear and terror, scattered in all directions, their only thought to escape the jaws of the monstrous intruder. None dared to confront the shark or attempt to rescue Kubo. As Kubo fought for his life, his desperate cries for help echoed through the salty air, a haunting plea that pierced the hearts of those who bore witness to the unfolding tragedy. Word of the harrowing incident quickly reached the lifeguards stationed at the beach. They sprang into action, armed with their life-saving equipment, racing against time to reach the swimmer. However, as they arrived on the scene, the tiger shark had already inflicted its grievous damage and departed, leaving behind a scene of unimaginable horror. Kubo had lost both legs in the vicious attack and lay injured and helpless in the water. With urgency and determination, the lifeguards wasted no time in their efforts to save Kubo. They swiftly carried him ashore, their faces etched with the gravity of the situation. The other surfers and swimmers who had witnessed the attack circled, their expressions a mix of shock, empathy, and sorrow. On the shore, the lifeguards worked tirelessly to tend to Kubo's injuries, and administer CPR desperately to revive him. The gravity of the situation weighed heavily on their shoulders as they fought to save a life hanging by the slenderest of threads. Tragically, despite their heroic efforts, Kubo had lost a devastating amount of blood. His injuries were catastrophic, and he couldn't muster the strength to recover. In the cruel twist of fate, he breathed his last on the beach that had witnessed his valiant struggle for survival long before the ambulance could even arrive. The incident sent shockwaves through New South Wales, reverberating with the grim realization of the peril that could lurk beneath the tranquil waters. It was a sad reminder of nature's raw power and unpredictability, where a man could be thrust into a life-and-death struggle in the blink of an eye. The authorities swung into action. Police boats sliced through the waters, their vigilant crews scouring the depths in a relentless quest to locate the predator responsible for this tragedy. The closure of the beach was a necessary measure, not only to preserve the scene for investigation, but also to protect the safety of any potential swimmers 
who might unwittingly step into the dangerous domain of the lurking shark. Inamoto Kubo's status as a Japanese national added an intricate layer of complexity to the situation. The Japanese consulate in Australia swiftly informed Kubo's next of kin and family in Japan. However, the vast geographical distance between continents and the bureaucratic intricacies of international communication meant that it took weeks before his grieving loved ones could be reached. Finally, after a prolonged period of waiting and uncertainty, Kubo's remains were carefully prepared and flown back to his homeland, where they would find their final resting place. He was laid to rest in a private cemetery in Japan, surrounded by the love and sorrow of his family. A poignant reminder of the international reach of this tragic incident. Nine-year-old Alvin Wright's heart danced with excitement when his father, Wright Bertrand, delivered the thrilling news of an upcoming family trip on the tranquil waters of the Bahamas. For a busy pilot like Wright, the dream of spending quality time with his beloved wife, Emily, and their cherished son had often felt elusive. Yet when the stars aligned and the opportunity presented itself, he wasted no time making their long-awaited family vacation a reality. With anticipation building, the family of three embarked on their adventure, renting a modest boat powered by a trusty small engine. Their vessel sliced through the crystalline waters, leaving a frothy wake in its path as it ventured into the expansive expanse of the Bahamian seas. As the boat gently rocked with the rhythmic motion of the waves, the three found their ideal spots for the journey ahead. Still wearing the smile that had graced his face since he shared the trip's news, Wright settled beside Emily. With their legs dangled over the boat's edge, they reveled in the water's refreshing coolness, gently caressing their feet. While Alvin was eager to respect his parents' privacy and the moment of reconnection they shared, he was equally eager to seize the day and make the most of his vacation. With youthful exuberance, he decided to strike a balance that allowed him to revel in both aspects of the trip. He jumped into the inviting water with a joyful leap, creating ripples that painted the surface with shimmering sunlight reflections. Alvin swam with unbridled delight, carving through the water like a young dolphin, each stroke propelling him farther from the boat and deeper into the boundless expanse of the sea. His parents watched with loving smiles, their hearts filled with pride as they witnessed their son's unquenchable spirit of adventure. Alvin's laughter, carried by the gentle breeze, mingled with the soft lapping of the waves against their boat. Then, like a sudden thunderbolt on a clear day, Wright heard a cry for help. In the azure expanse, he saw his beloved child, Alvin, caught in a fierce struggle with an unseen adversary. Panic surged through Wright's veins as he shouted for Alvin to swim back to the boat's safety. But Alvin's cries pierced the air, an urgent plea for help that echoed off the horizon. Something was wrong. In that fateful moment, there was no hesitation. Wright knew he had to reach his son, regardless of the dangers that lurked beneath the waves. Without a second thought, he plunged into the water, his powerful strokes carrying him swiftly toward the epicenter of the turmoil. As he drew nearer, a chilling sight froze his blood. Alvin, their fearless young explorer, was entangled in a life-and-death struggle with a formidable adversary, a shark. The predator had clamped its razor-sharp teeth onto Alvin's clothing, preventing him from breaking free. Panic and desperation filled the young boy's eyes as he thrashed helplessly against the relentless grip of the shark. Fear surged within Wright, but he called upon his age-old wisdom and knowledge reservoir. His thoughts raced as he considered his options. He knew he had to act swiftly to save his son. In that harrowing moment, Wright followed the advice he had heard repeatedly, to target the shark's vulnerable gills. With his heart pounding in his chest, he swiftly removed one of his shoes, his hands trembling with the situation's intensity. Gripping the shoe with a determined resolve, he unleashed a barrage of forceful strikes upon the shark's gills, each blow delivered with an enthusiasm born of love and desperation. The shark, taken by surprise and overwhelmed by the sudden assault, reluctantly relinquished its grip on Alvin's clothing. It let go and retreated into the ocean's depths, a shadow disappearing into the abyss. Wright's unyielding determination had prevailed. Gasping for breath and trembling from the adrenaline rush, Wright immediately reached out to Alvin. Together they swam back to the safety of their boat, 
the vessel that had become their sanctuary amidst the dangerous waters. On board, Emily was a frantic witness to the life and death drama that had unfolded before her eyes. Her relief upon seeing her husband and son returning to the boat was palpable, her tears a testament to her anguish. The journey back to the shore was solemn, marked by the profound realization that their family had narrowly escaped a tragedy of unimaginable proportions. Upon reaching the shore, their first order of business was to seek medical attention for Alvin. Still reeling from the shock of the encounter, Emily could hardly contain her anxiety, especially when the word shark hung heavily in the air. The doctor's verdict, however, was a soothing balm to their frayed nerves. Despite the terrifying ordeal, Alvin had emerged unscathed. He was remarkably physically unharmed, a testament to his resilience and the quick thinking of his father. As the doctor's reassuring words washed over them, Alvin's eyes sparkled with a determination that defied his tender age. He voiced his unwavering resolve. Nothing would deter him from returning to the water. This close encounter with danger had only steeled his spirit, instilling a sense of courage to accompany him throughout his life. In the early hours of an Easter morning in 1996, Morita Gwen awoke with an inexplicable sense of purpose. The sun had yet to rise, and the world was still cloaked in the hush of dawn. Morita, at 57 years old, felt an unusual urge to seize the day, to greet the waves of the ocean before joining his wife for Easter service. With a silent determination, Morita mounted his trusty motorcycle and drove towards his cherished destination, a beach renowned for its dependable waves nestled near the mouth of Honolulu Harbor. When Morita arrived at the beach, the morning light rays painted the sky with delicate hues. It was around 6.30 a.m. when he reached the shore, a ritualistic pilgrimage for a man who had made the ocean a part of his daily life. With practiced ease, he exchanged his regular attire for the familiar embrace of his surfing gear. The anticipation of the waves and the cool water's thrill against his skin was a sensation he relished as he waded into the ocean board in hand. Morita knew the ins and outs of these waters, especially the shallow regions near the reef where the waves were most predictable. As Morita embarked on his solitary journey, his fellow regular surfers began to arrive, drawn to the promise of Easter waves. They joined him in the water, a community brought together by their shared love for the ocean and the art of riding its waves. Time seemed to stretch as they rode the swells, the sun's ascent mirrored by the rising crescendo of excitement among the surfers. Eventually, Morita lay upon his board, belly down, arms and legs trailing in the water, a posture he had adored. It was a moment of serenity, a chance to commune with the ocean, to feel its ebb and flow beneath him. But on this day, tranquility gave way to terror in the blink of an eye. Suddenly, without warning, the tranquility of the morning was shattered as Morita was violently jolted from his reverie. A force of nature, a predator of the deep had descended upon him. A tiger shark struck with devastating swiftness, sinking its teeth into Morita's right leg. The initial shock left Morita gasping, a muffled cry escaping his lips as he realized his dire predicament. Panic clawed at his chest as he tried in vain to free his leg from the powerful grip of the shark. In that moment of despair, he whispered a desperate prayer, imploring the shark to release its hold. But the relentlessly determined shark showed no sign of relinquishing its prey. As the pressure intensified and the creature thrashed, Morita's pleas went unanswered. In the grip of fear and adrenaline, Morita knew he had no choice but to fight for his life. Gathering every ounce of strength and courage, he unleashed a torrent of punches and shouted obscenities at the predatory beast. His fellow surfers, instinctively attuned to the distress of a comrade, paddled urgently towards the unfolding horror. With unwavering resolve, they reached Morita, their collective strength greater than the sum of its parts. One of them, in a wooden canoe, wielded a paddle as a makeshift weapon against the unyielding shark, striking with the force of desperation. The struggle was brutal, the waters around them turning crimson with Morita's blood. Yet amid the chaos and the fear of losing his limb, Morita clung to life with a tenacity that defied the odds. One of the surfers, recounting the terrifying ordeal to Morita's son Curtis, explained how the shark had initially dragged Morita underwater to gain an advantage. But Morita's composure and resilience played a vital role in their struggle against the predator. 
Morita's steady demeanor kept hope alive during those harrowing moments. Amid the chaos and blood-stained waters, they improvised a tourniquet using their board leashes and applied it to Morita's injured leg. With a collective effort, they managed to hoist him onto a longboard, a makeshift stretcher that carried him back to shore. During the ordeal, Morita at one point stole a glance at his mangled leg. To his shock, he could see only bone on his right ankle. The tourniquet they applied turned out to be a lifeline. Paramedics later revealed that Morita would have bled to death without it, and the ocean would have claimed another victim. Upon reaching the hospital, Morita's thoughts briefly turned to his missed Easter service. But this fleeting sadness was eclipsed by his overwhelming gratitude for surviving such a harrowing encounter. In the end, doctors had to amputate his affected foot, and he underwent another surgery to facilitate his recovery. He confessed that his only concern was that the amputation wouldn't extend above his knee. And mercifully, it didn't. Despite the trauma and physical loss, Marita remained resolute in his determination. The incident hadn't extinguished his love for the ocean or his passion for surfing. With an unyielding faith in God that had strengthened in recent years, Morita managed to ward off despair and depression. His spirit remained unbroken. Recognizing the immense medical expenses that lay ahead, a website was established to raise funds for Morita's treatment. The response from well-wishers, friends, and strangers alike was heartwarming. It was a testament to the compassion and support that people can offer in times of adversity. Months later, Morita was discharged from the hospital. His head held high as he ventured back into the world a changed man but undeniably resilient.